our keynote speaker today um, has an extensive resume and career um, full of accolades, awards, and, um, and notoriety. And you've read the press releases, you've seen the website, it's in the program. I don't actually want to talk to the the achievements or the placement in the press or the industry or the, the, the music charts and, and awards, uh, I, I want to speak very briefly to the weight of taking the stage as an artist and carrying messages from town to town, city to city, country to country, uh, when that message is uh, is is felt as a need from a community and from an audience, um, and felt as a, a core uh, view and an important voice by the artist themselves. But the, the weight that the expectation of an audience, of a community, of society has on an artist to uh, show up and deliver that message. So it, it was uh, with great concern and respect that when uh, Rhiannon and I were able to to talk about this. It was through the the really a, a, a promise made that this is not yet another uh, invitation to come and speak to something and to an audience uh, with that sense of uh, token uh, message or moment. That the the promise that that I made and that I have uh, extended in, in all of these the conversations and that we as a board and staff and team and community have committed to uh, and that I invite you to enter into for this keynote presentation is a promise to not just listen and applaud and nod, but to take in deeply the message and the need for us to open the doors and windows of the House of Folk to reconstruct it if necessary, but to ensure that we hear, see, and celebrate all of the voices of folk music in its truest, deepest sense, the music of the people. The promise is that we will listen and we will act. Please welcome to the stage, Rhiannon Giddens.
I wrote that song after reading Ned Sublet's book, Cuba and Its Music, which focuses, the, the, the first few chapters of which focus on the trans-Saharan Arabic slave trade, because uh, I am that girl at the party. <laughs> you know, the one that people see coming and they go, oh God, I really just wanted to drink my wine and think about the Kardashians, and here she comes. I have come to accept this. Um, and I suspect that there are quite a few of us girls and boys at the party here at Folk Alliance. And so I feel, yes, and so I feel in good company. I feel a line of t-shirts coming on. <laughs> anyway, when I read these chapters, I, was, I learned about the, the Quion. I'm not sure about the pronunciation because I just read it, but they were highly skilled and enslaved female musicians who played lutes, and they were really, really, they were very highly trained. And over a thousand years ago, they were bought and sold with a list of songs that they knew, said to be in the thousands of verses. And this, this idea of something that I had no idea about, that was this vast thing that happened so long ago, really struck me. And I thought, how many hundreds, thousands, millions, billions of stories like this will we never know? How many little stories within the big histories? And isn't this the point of folk music? The countless little stories without which we have no history at all. Whether accompanied by harp in the Hebrides, by beats in Chicago, by the Kora in Mali, by the guitar in Melbourne, this is what we are here to do. We are the witnesses we are the watchers, the lookers, the thinkers, the observers. We are the spinners, the weavers, the knitters, the believers. We see a thread, another, and another, and we twist them together. We put one color next to another color, and we make combinations the world has never seen. We put them on a needle and pour out a blanket that covers us all, protects us from the cold, even when there is no cold because the world is on fire. You see, we are not just the storytellers this time. We are not just the history keepers this time. We are not just the voices of the oppressed this time. This is it. It's all happening now. The decline and fall of a way of life that benefits the few at the expense of the many. While we eat Doritos and throw away the package, millions of years in production for a moment of chemically altered, salted goodness, while we drive around and rush our traffic in our automobiles going from point A to point A in two hours flat, while we vacation in a concrete jungle looking for the thrills that we used to get in the actual jungle, while we pretend that recycling plastic is anything more than an unbelievably successful cash grab by already rich people so that we can feel better about that bottle of tap water or maybe it was spring water stolen from an already perilously drought-stricken place that we just bought for $2.99 because we just had to have a drink of water right now. <laughs> While we run from poverty dressed up as success, posting our fundraisers for medical expenses on Facebook, while we eradicate childhood diseases just to put children in cages, while we run from racial ignorance dressed up in a uniform, well, only some of us make it, while we run from authoritarian regime to dictatorship, children on our backs and hearts in our mouths, while we run from the rising tides caused by the overflow of a sickeningly hungover society half a world away, while we huddle around our flames, burning years of history, except that it doesn't happen as much anymore because it's too hot, because the world 
is on fire. Our way of life, the way of life that brings us here at this hotel made of compressed wood, concrete, brought here by the fossil fuels that have been fought over for countless years, where we, hound out, where we hand out sounds inscribed on precious metals and packaged in petroleum, is dying. Like that sinner, we will do anything to delay the inevitable end. Like that sinner, we think throwing the wealth extracted from our mother at it will fix it. Like that sinner, we fear that journey into the unknown, the, the transition from one thing to another. It was just Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and you know that means the safe version of King is trotted out, and everyone congratulates themselves for having taken a moment to consider, I have a dream. Well, it was not for the I have a dream speech that he was killed. He said in 1967, I am convinced that if we are to get on the right side of the world revolution, we as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values. We must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. When machines and computers, profit motives, and property rights are considered more important than people, 
the giant triplets of racism, extreme materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. A true revolution of values will soon look uneasily on the glaring contrast of poverty and wealth with righteous indignation. It will look across the seas and see individual capitalists of the West investing huge sums of money in Asia, Africa, and South America only to take the profits out with no concern for the social betterment of the countries and say, this is not just. It will look at our alliance with the landed gentry of South America and say, this is not just. The Western arrogance of feeling that it has everything to teach others and nothing to learn from them is not just." End quote. He said this a year to the day before he was assassinated in Memphis. Prophecy. And I know, hashtag not all we, that there are vast inequalities as to who is benefiting and who is sacrificing and who is doing a little bit of both. Native communities struggling to hold on to traditional ways of life, millions of people displaced by climate change they did not cause, but the outcome, unfortunately, is the same. The bill is coming due, and given the nature of our interconnected world, everyone will have to pay. And the ones that pay the most are usually the ones that have benefited the least. They have nowhere to go when the world is on fire. And this is what is consuming my every day. What good is it to be a folk singer in the face of an unbearable future of an environment changed beyond all recognition? To see what the might of westward expansion has done to our natural world. What good is it to the people despairing in Australia, in the Congo, in India, in Flint, Michigan? How do we, each of us, in this comfy hotel, come to terms with the amount of, uh, of individual privilege that we have in a way that can serve the greater good through our song? Once upon a time, a woman sat by her friend, and he was dying of AIDS. I did housework all morning and was terrified when the time came to sit by his bedside, she said. I did what I always did when I was afraid. I sang the song that gave me courage. I sang it for two and a half hours. It comforted me, which comforted him. The contrast between the morning and the afternoon was profound. I felt as if I had given generously of my essence to my dear friend while I sang to him. I also found that I felt deeply comforted myself, which in turn was comforting to him. Kate Munger was then inspired to start something called a threshold choir, to sing people close to death over to the other side. Over 100 chapters in North America now provide this service, a soulful musical connection to death that in many corners of Western life we have destroyed. Did you know that one of the last senses you lose when you die is your hearing? The last thing you take with you into the night is sound. Cries of grief, words of forgiveness, music from the soul. All of us here, all of the people in the world singing the little stories that make up the big histories, we are the global threshold choir. We are the ones who are to witness the natural end of centuries of impossible growth, of distorted values, of the placement of one species, humanity, above all others. In our great hand of Tarot, the death card has been played. But what people forget is that death means transformation. What can we gain in this great transition? We are capable of so much destruction, but ah, Look at the beautiful things we can create. Look at the ways we can connect, even though so many in positions of power strive to separate us. We come together in art. We come together in music. We come together in words. We bring each other home. And so it is that we must do exactly what we are doing. Our future depends on it. A consciousness shift is not born of facts and figures, although they can lead us there. 
It is born of compassion, of empathy, and of love above all else. A true love, an acceptance of our behavior, an acceptance of our genius, an acceptance of our failures. Three years ago, I co-produced with Dirk Powell the album Freedom Highway. The day the album came out, me and the band played kind of a special open of the tour show. We played in Sing Sing Prison as part of a program for Carnegie Hall. We spent the day with a group of prisoners who were in a music program. They were learning beats, guitar, and there was even a string quartet. People who had never played any of those instruments before. We did a song with one of the inmates. It was a song about domestic violence that he had written. And that evening, we performed songs that I had written inspired by the history of slavery in the United States that took on an extra intense meaning behind those bars. I don't know what they did. Ultimately, it doesn't matter. What I felt then, I'm still processing it three years later. What I felt then was the incredible power music has to cut through the chase and heal the spirit. Not just listening, but creating and creating together. I saw those men have a voice that they hadn't had before, a voice that they hadn't been allowed to have. And I saw what that did for them, and I saw what that meant for them. And it's a proud memory for me. More than any number of albums sold or any award, for it is the true purpose of the music we make. And it is what we must hold up overall in the days to come. Now look, I'm completely aware of the juxtaposition of reading you this speech on an iPad. <laughs> Speaking into a microphone, being amplified with electricity and the lovely sound folks back there so that everyone can hear. But I don't, I don't have all those, I don't have any actually of the answers. I just have a lot of questions. But I will say that we need to use what we have. You know, I flew here yesterday. I don't know what that means. I use one of these, I'm trying. Um, I use a computer to research and write this speech. I use my phone in more ways than should be humanly possible. My Facebook community has contributed to me maintaining my sanity in more ways than I can count. We paid a lot and will pay a lot for these devices, for these advancements. So we need to use them for good as much as we can, while we can. Let's use them to learn to focus and to let go. In 1969, a moment of magic, of Richie Havens creating a song out of thin air was captured on film, <laughs> later uploaded to YouTube, and uh, I subsequently watched that clip about uh, 243 times. <laughs> this is Francesco Teresi, by the way.
2020. You conjurers of tales, you creators of magic, you crafters of beauty. This is a beautiful, beautiful thing. I love what has been done with this conference. I love what is being done with folk music. And if you know anything about me, you know I hate genres. <laughs> with a passion of a thousand sons. I recognize the need for groups. I recognize the need for trying to identify. I rest, recognize the need to feel like you're in a community. I get it. Folk music is still a community to me. It's not a bin in the store. Because right now, right now commercial music has not served us too well. What has gone on into making commercial music is just an outgrowth of everything that I've talked about in this speech, and we need to reject it. We need to use what we need to use as the tools to get the music out there, to get it to the people who need to have it, to tell the stories that need to be told, to cross the borders that need to be crossed, because there is no world music. There's folk music. You know, there's folk music of the world, of which America, Canada, North America, we're just one part, you know? But it's wonderful that we host this here and that it's being opened up to the world, you know? And hopefully we'll see more and more of that as the years pass. So I'm very proud to be here and to be, have been asked to give this speech. This was all, I, 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 this was extemporaneous, it's not written down, so I have, I'll get back to the regularly scheduled words in a second. <laughs> well, it all is, just some of it was planned a little beforehand. Um, you know, to see this collaboration was beautiful, you know. So I, I as, just, yes. <laughs> Despite the darkness which, which I began this speech, I am very hopeful. I am very hopeful because music is, it's a, it's a powerful, powerful thing. Humanity is poised, it's on the brink. And no matter what they think, we are the link. As Tony once said, one of the best writers ever, today is always here, tomorrow, never. The we is the we is the we. We are the watchers, but we are the doers. It's not enough to go down swinging. I'm here to tell you that all of us must go down singing. <laughs> we must hold up the bold, celebrate the youth, venerate the old, and sing the truth. Let it be the last sound. Let it be the last sound. Let that be the last sound we hear. Thank you. Thank you.